Guy Kawasaki, the chief evangelist of Canva, the brand ambassador for Mercedes-Benz, and the former chief evangelist of Apple. He is also the author of 15 books, including our personal favorite, The Art of the Start. He will be discussing the HR leader's role in accelerating business growth, unlocking people's potential, and the role of technology. Thank you so much for joining us, Guy, and we're extremely excited for your talk. Over to you, Guy. Hi, I'm Guy Kawasaki, and I am in Northern California right now, but I'm going to talk to you about rebuilding your businesses in a pandemic. First, a little bit about my background. I worked in the Macintosh division of Apple. Uh, I'm in the upper left-hand corner of this picture, and that was just an amazing experience. My job was to be a software evangelist, so my job was to convince people to write Macintosh software and develop Macintosh hardware. Um, obviously, the most important person, or maybe not obviously, but I'll tell you, the most important person in this picture is the one kneeling in the front, so that's Steve Jobs. And, he was just an amazing person. Every story you heard about Steve Jobs is probably true, uh, but you had to be there. And I consider it an honor and, well, I don't know about a pleasure, but it was certainly an honor to work there. And I would not be where I am were it not for Steve Jobs. Uh, interesting historical fact, this is probably the only known instance of Steve Jobs ever being on his knees for anyone. So very important picture. Uh, this was just the largest collection of... Oh, man, amazing people. And I hope everybody, once in your life, you have a chance to work for a Macintosh division. We truly did dent the universe. So after the Macintosh division, I started some companies. I returned to Apple as Apple's chief evangelist. Then I left again, and I've become a writer and a speaker. Currently, I'm chief evangelist of Canva, which is an online graphics design service company out of Sydney, Australia. And uh, I am a podcaster, so podcasting and evangelizing Canva. Uh, by the way, uh, the word evangelist, let me explain that to you. It comes from a Greek word meaning bringing the good news. So what I did as a Macintosh evangelist was bring the good news of Macintosh, how we would make people more creative and more productive. And now I'm the chief evangelist of Canva, so I'm bringing the good news of Canva. So. This is a very brief explanation of my past. Uh, you know, right now we're in a very interesting time, and I think it presents many challenges to organizations. And I've been in Silicon Valley my whole career. I have been through some ups and downs. Uh, nothing like this, however, but I have definitely faced a lot of challenges. So I'd like to pass along some of my thoughts, some of my ideas, strategies, and tactics for you to help you know, rebuild business, build business even stronger, and in the words of Steve Jobs, dent the universe. So I use a top 10 format for my speeches so that people can track progress through my speech. So here's my top 10 about rebuilding business in the middle of a pandemic. So I think point number one is to have the right perspective. You know, what are we facing? And I think it's a mistake to think that we're in a sprint. You know, when times are great and, and everybody's in a great economy and people are making investments and everybody's buying a lot of stuff and all that, you know, then it's a sprint and it's a it's a hundred meters or it's a hundred yards. But right now in a pandemic, we 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 really don't know when there'll be a vaccine, when you know there'll be medical technology that truly quote unquote fixes this. So I think the proper mental framework for any employee today is this is not a 100-meter sprint. It's not a 100-yard sprint. It is a marathon. It's miles and miles. So mentally, you have to put yourself in this mindset. This is for the long haul. And to continue using a running metaphor, I might even make the case that it's a decathlon of which one event is the marathon in the sense that, you know, a sprint is simply running. A marathon is also simply running, obviously for a long distance, but a decathlon has multiple events. And that truly is what we're in the middle of, where it's not that you can just be good at one thing, you need to be good at multiple things. So point number one is 
Let's run the right race. It is a marathon or a decathlon. It is not a sprint. Point number two is I think in these times where most people are working from home, um, the, the model for management should to always give your employees the benefit of the doubt. And by this I mean, you know, people are working from home, they have kids around them. I have four kids, so I truly know this. You know, they're going crazy, they're jumping down on the couch, they have to be fed, they have to be, you know, online at the right time, they, they need to have their Zoom working and all this kind of stuff. So I think if there's ever a time to give employees the benefit of the doubt that, you know, you assume that they're, they're trustworthy, that they're doing the job, they're not just goofing around all day. Uh, that's the perspective. It's a very positive, you know, glass half full kind of perspective. You're assuming the best about your employees because I think that if you, if you start trying to monitor them, and, you know, let's take an extreme case. Let's suppose that there's some technology to measure how long people are in what app per day and you start monitoring this i think that yeah you may have a better idea of how your employees are spending the day but the message that that sends to your workers is so negative that boy i would i just i just can't imagine that that is the right thing to do so give your employees the benefit of the doubt they're at their home, it's stressful, they're doing the best that they can, and I think they will do the best that they can. A point number three is to remember that, you know, people want to be part of something that's larger than themselves, that it's, it's not just about making a buck, it's not just about sales. So I think it's about making meaning. How are you making the world a better place? And to keep that message going throughout your organizations that, yes, we're in a difficult time, but it's not merely about making a buck or a rupee or a yen. It is about how we impact the lives of our customers. So here are three very good examples. So, you know, you could say that Apple is all about selling Macintoshes and selling iPhones and iPads. But really, Apple's higher road is about increasing people's productivity and creativity. You know, Google, you could say it's about selling ads. But really, I think what people think about Google is that it has truly democratized information, that all the information in the world is now online, and Google helps you get to it. And the company that I work for, Canva, uh, it's not simply about making pretty designs. It's about democratizing design so that anybody can make better designs and become a better communicator. So just remember the meaning that you make. Remind your employees, you know, this is fundamentally what we do. We increase people's creativity and productivity. We democratize information. We democratize design. We dent the universe. Point number four is that even now, in the middle of a pandemic, innovation counts. Arguably, innovation may count even more now because, as I said before, you know, we're, we're not exactly in this great bust out, everybody's making all kinds of sales and revenues at record levels. It's a tough slog. And so one of the ways that you differentiate your organization from anybody else's is that you are jumping to the next curve. In other words, you are still innovating. So I like to use an example of ice. So believe it or not, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, this was the state of the art of getting ice. It was people on frozen lakes and ponds with horses and saws and sleighs. So this is ice 1.0. Nine million pounds of ice was harvested in the United States in 1900. Ice 2.0 was the ice factory. Now the ice man delivered ice to your house. This was much better than ice harvesting because guess what? It doesn't have to be a cold city. It doesn't have to be a cold time of year. You know, there probably wasn't a lot of ice harvesting in India and Singapore and Southeast Asia. But now you could have an ice factory anywhere in the world. It could freeze water anytime, and the ice man would deliver ice to your house. That's ice 2.0. Ice 3.0 is even better. This is the refrigerator curve. 
Now you had your own ice factory, a PC, if you will, a personal chiller. So now we've gone from harvesting ice, seasonal, have to be in a cold place, to freezing water centrally, ice man delivers your ice to your house, to having your own refrigerator, ice one, ice two, ice three. That's the ice curve. So what I'm telling you is that I think that great innovation can occur during a pandemic, and it is a matter of jumping to the next curve, not simply staying on the same curve and doing things better, faster, and cheaper. You know, when I worked for Apple, the current curve was the Apple II. And one of the things that I learned from Steve Jobs is if you ask your current customers, what's the innovation that you want? What's the next curve? What's this thing that's 10 times better? Usually your customers can only express what they want in terms of what they're already getting. So if they're buying an Apple II from you, guess what? They're going to say, I want a better, faster, cheaper Apple II. Better, faster, cheaper IBM PC. Better, faster, cheaper ice factory. Very few people can express the next curve. And so this is something that you need to communicate to your employees that, you know, like, I'm not saying ignore customers. Customers can tell you how to make the current curve better. But to truly get to the next curve, it comes from your passion, your insights, your heart. And I'm going to tell you later in the speech a very good question to ask to get to the next curve. But it is about innovation and getting to the next curve. Number five, number five is uh, I have a very low opinion of wishful thinking that you know somehow the miracle will occur, that it's taken years to develop vaccines, but the miracle will occur, and you know, by this fall, there will be this miracle vaccine, and the pandemic will be cured. Listen, I hope it happens, but I don't think you should depend on what we call in America the white knight who rides in on the white horse and at the very last minute saves everything. It's not going to happen. Don't assume it's going to happen. You know, it's, it's time to be realistic. It's going to take a lot of hard work. Again, marathon or decathlon, not sprint. Don't have this foolish assumption that the miracle will occur. You know, if you said to a person, our strategy for rebuilding a business is that the miracle will occur, you're going to look like a fool. Miracles sometimes occur. But to depend on a miracle is a very foolish strategy. Don't depend on a miracle occurring. Number six. Number six is if there was ever a time to be transparent and to be real, it is now. Let us face it. The tide is out. Many organizations like this boat are aground. And so because so much is aground, so many organizations are aground, so many people are having difficult times, now you can be transparent about that. If there was ever a time to be honest with your employees and say, listen, you know, this is what's happening, this is our problems, you know, this is what we have to fix, and to be real. Uh, and by being real, I mean that, you know, I think that there's such a thing as toxic positivity which is you're always up and you're always saying, don't worry, it'll work out, have faith, the miracle will occur. I said, I, I understand that theory, and you, know, you can apply that theory to child raising too, that you tell your kids, listen, things are going to get better, you know, it'll work out, trust me and all that. So there is a line between positivity and toxic positivity. And toxic positivity occurs when, you know, people know that you're making it up, that things might not really work out, and that things are not good right now. So I think you need to avoid toxic positivity as much as you avoid toxic negativity. Um, don't be delusional and positive, okay? Like, let's be real, let's be open. Number seven. Number seven is my thought that, you know, you're going to, Ask a lot from your current employees. You're going to be working under difficult, if not depressing, conditions. Many of them remote, kids jumping up and down on the sofa, 
uh, you know, this, this concept that, wow, you know, remote work is so great. I don't have to commute an hour each way. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's true, but I'm, I'm somebody who is working remote and it's not that easy. Uh, again, there's kids, there's school, you know, you, you used to be able to distance from that and, you know, focus on work, but now you're on deck 24 by seven. So this sign, <laughs> this picture, it was very hard to find a good photo of stock options. And honestly, this is the best photo I could find. So I think that right now, if there's ever a time to use equity and stock options as a motivation, this is it. So if you're asking employees to make special efforts uh, to you know, go above and beyond the call of duty, I think you should reward them with the potential upside of a company. So if there's ever a time to use stock versus money, uh, this is it. So I think you should be very generous with your stock right now. And um, I think that aligns the organization because, you know, with money, you immediately got it. With stock, it's only worth something if the stock is valuable. And I think that aligns the organization. Number eight, number eight is because I'm eternally an optimist, uh, this is the time to do the dirty jobs. So uh, there was a TV show in America called Dirty Jobs with Mike Rowe. And I love this show. And what he would do is he would go around the United States and he would do the dirty jobs, cleaning out the sewer, taking out the trash, you know, cleaning the, the mm. parts of the bridge that's underwater performing artificial insemination, uh, working in the recycling factory. He, he would just do the most awful jobs. And I'm not advocating that everybody has to do things of that nature, but I'm saying that now, now's the time to do the stuff that we never had time to do before. Uh, gaining new skills, training, writing the documentation that you never had time to do before, uh, learning these new technologies. I mean, this is the time because this pandemic, at some point, this economy will turn around. And it would be great if we had all the dirty jobs done and we came out of this pandemic stronger than when we went into it. Now, don't get me wrong. I realize it's easy for me to say and it's for you to do. But I think, you know, if you have this um, total attitude of giving up, uh, that won't work. Now is the time to do the dirty jobs. Uh, number nine, number nine is my recommendation that you ignore naysayers. Now, I'm, I'm not, you know, you heard my diatribe about toxic positivity, but I also think that cannot listen to people who tell you that it can't be done, it shouldn't be done, and it isn't necessary. I like to call these people bozos. And I, there are two kinds of bozos in the world. So one bozo is slovingly disgusting, body odor, pocket protector, dandruff, you know, you're just a loser. That's not the dangerous bozo. People are smart enough to ignore a loser. Only a, lo a loser would listen to a loser. So the dangerous bozo, the dangerous naysayer, is the, quote, winner bozo. So this is the person who wears all black, you know, has a nice car, rich and famous. And there's a temptation to conflate fame and money with wisdom. And I'm not saying that it's negatively correlated, but it certainly isn't perfectly positively correlated. The danger of a successful rich and famous bozo is that you think, oh, rich and famous people telling me it can't be done, it shouldn't be done, I should listen to that person because that person must be smart. I would make the case that you suspend your assumption that rich and famous equals smart. And I, I want to, like, I, I think that using a medical term, I think that bozosity is kind of like an illness. And, you know, we, we take vaccines for illnesses. We take vaccines for the flu. So I'm going to give you a little bit of virtual vaccine to help prevent negativity and naysaying from infecting you and killing you. So 
I think there's a world market for maybe five computers. Thomas Watson, chairman of IBM, allegedly said this. So the f chairman of IBM thought there was a world market for five computers. I have five Macintoshes in my house. I have all the computers he anticipated in the world, in my house. So imagine if Stephen Waz saw this quote and said, huh, we shouldn't start Apple. There's only going to be a market for five computers in the world. Why would we start a computer company? There would be no Apple. Second one, this telephone has too many shortcomings to be seriously considered as a means of communication. The device is inherently of no value to us. Western Union internal memo. Okay, so Western Union wrote off telephony in 1876. Oops. You know, so there was ice harvesting, ice factory, refrigerator. So there was, you know, drums, telegraph, telephone, mobile, or VoIP. Basically, Western Union said that telegraphs are good. Telephones has too many shortcomings. Why would we embrace the telephone? Huh. Uh, this is a perfect example of, you know, if you were back then, you'd say, wow, Western Union, they dominate telegraphs. They dominate communication. If they say telephones aren't going to succeed, they know what they're talking about. Let's not do a telephone. Third example, there's no reason why anyone would want a computer in their home. Ken Olson, great entrepreneur great innovator, but he said no one would want a computer in their home. He worked for a mini computer company. He started a mini computer company. Arguably, he created mini computers, but he was so successful selling mini computers, guess what? He could not embrace personal computers. This is like if you had a lot of successful ice factories, centralized freezing of water, would you embrace personal computers or refrigerators? That's the question. So this is why it's dangerous to ask someone who's extremely successful on one curve, what do you think of the next curve? Now, I'm not saying that whenever people say you'll fail, it means you'll succeed. But I am telling you, if you listen to these people and don't try, you will never know. And I think that's the worst outcome of all, never knowing. Number 10. Number 10 is the most important question HR could ask, management could ask, each employee could ask, which is, therefore, what? And by this I mean, you look at your insights into your industry, your business, your company, your product, your service, and you look at the conditions, the pandemic, the economy, cybersecurity, politics, whatever it is. And you ask yourself, well, based on what I see and what I see coming, what opportunities happen? Therefore, what? And let's go back in history a little bit to show you how this could have worked. So this is a screenshot from my Instagram account. Now, I admit that I love peanut butter and banana sandwiches, and I love my Yeti mug, okay? So this is what I have for breakfast every morning. And I'm not showing you this to talk about dietary habits. I'm showing you this because this is one of my favorite posts from Instagram. So the question is, if this were 10 or 15 years ago, and you say to yourself, hmm, huh, you know, Motorola just came out with this cellular phone. It's as big as a brick, but that phone is going to get smaller. And... You know, there could be cameras in this phone. And then this phone could communicate data. So if you think about it, so we're going to have cellular phones. Phones are no longer tied to a place. They are tied to a person. So we're going to have cellular phones with cameras connected. Therefore, what? Why don't we create a picture sharing service and we'll call it Instagram? So I think in a pandemic, you have to ask yourself, you know, if you're in online education, you're saying, well, kids are not be going to go back to school right now. Kids are all going to be educated virtually. 
Therefore, what? You know, what's the opportunities in online education? If you're Instacart and you say, well, you know, people are very hesitant to go to markets now. You know, what's the ramifications of this? And you go through your industry and you look at the conditions and you ask yourself, therefore, what? And I think this will help you figure out how to jump to the next curve. Again, I don't think it's going to necessarily be your current customer. Asking the Apple II owner, how do we get to the next curve? I don't think so. I think it's more Steve Jobs, you know, he went to Xerox Park, he saw a graphical user interface, he saw that people were having a difficult time figuring out MS-DOS and even the Apple II, and he said, well, there's this new interface, more people could use it, chips are getting more powerful and cheaper, therefore what? Therefore Macintosh. So, the question to ask is, therefore what? Number 10, number 10 is not about drugs or politics, it is about my Let's see. Explanation in four words about what the goal of an organization and really what a person's goal should be in life, which is to get high and to the right. So, if you had a graph like this, uniqueness on the vertical axis, value on the horizontal axis, I think this explains positioning, branding, product development, Marketing, human resources, career development, I think it explains, frankly, life. So, in the bottom right corner, you have something valuable, but it's not unique. There, you always have to compete on price. Dell makes billions of dollars there, but it's always about price. In the upper left-hand corner, there you have something that's truly unique, but it is of no use. You are just a bozo. You are stupid in that corner. In the bottom left corner, you have something that's not valuable and not unique. That is the worst corner of all. That's like selling dog food online, but there's also 20 other companies selling dog food online. But nobody wants to buy dog food online because it's just as expensive when you add shipping and handling. And then you have to be at home. Well, in a pandemic, you're home. But you have to be at home when the dog food came. So it's not valuable and it's not unique because stupid people like me in Silicon Valley fund it. 10 different ways to buy dog food online. So the upper right-hand corner, that's where you want to be, up there, okay? Think of the iPod. When it first came out, it was unique and valuable. It had a user interface that mere mortals could use. What a concept. It had a wide selection of music. What a concept. It was legal to get this music. What a concept. And it was also cheap to get this music. 99 cents. The iPod was unique and valuable. So, as a company, what makes your product unique and valuable? If you're in engineering, you make a unique and valuable product. If you are in sales and marketing, you convince the world that you have a unique and valuable product. If you are an employee, guess what? Unique and valuable employees command the highest salary and the most power. So a unique and valuable employee is the goal for every employee in an organization. You want to be unique and valuable. This is the holy grail of life. You want to be unique and valuable. This is my last slide. This slide shows the cover of my podcast. It's called Remarkable People. If you open up your phone camera, don't take a picture of this, although you could, if you open up your camera and just put it on that QR code, the QR code will take you to my podcast. And my podcast is a collection of interviews with remarkable people such as Jane Goodall, who you see here, simulating looking for lice in my hair. So I have people like Jane Goodall, Martha Stewart, Ariana Huffington, Stephen Wolfram, Andrew Yang, Christy Yamaguchi, oh, Scott Galloway, I mean, you name it. Uh, I have a lot of remarkable people who are interviewed, and this podcast is about them. It's not about me. It's 95% them, 5% me. Uh, it will help you become a remarkable person. So to wrap up, because I'm running out of time, 
I think the key to rebuilding business in a pandemic is about these these ten things that you know it, it is about running the right race. It is about understanding it's a marathon, it's a decathlon, it's not a sprint. It's about continuing to innovate. Ice one, ice two, ice three, getting to the next curve. It is about not listening to naysayers who tell you that it can't be done, it shouldn't be done, it isn't necessary. It is about taking the high road, trusting your employees, giving them the benefit of the doubt, sharing the potential wealth. It's all those things. I'm not saying it's going to be easy. I'm not saying that everything is going to be fun, but you know it can be done. Um, this too will not last. This too shall end. And there will be brighter days ahead. So I'm Guy Kawasaki. And I hope you've enjoyed this virtual conference. I hope you got a lot of value out of it. And as I say, or more accurately as Steve said, I hope you dent the universe, change the world. It still can be done. Thank you very much. Wow. What a wonderful session and such contagious.